Okay, yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another session of the Expanded Animation Symposium. Uh, the next 19 minutes will comprise two talks dealing with the topic uh, Games and Art, where play and digital space are examined from an artistic perspective. The first talk will be held by Margarete Jaman. She's a Ladic artist and a media theorist a professor and head of the Department of Experimental Game Cultures at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. In her talk, Hybrid Ladic Assemblages, Margarete Jaman will focus on the conscious change of established game dynamics in Ladic arrangements between human and non-human actants. So without further ado, please welcome Margarete Jaman with a warm applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael Lakis, for the kind introduction. Um, and also to the Expanded Animation Symposium in general for the um, possibility to show a talk and uh, several exchanges on the topic of games and art. And I'm announced as an artist and scholar in games and uh, expanded games, so to say. But I'm also focusing on experimental game cultures, also in academia as professor for the new study department with the same name at the University of Applied Arts. So this is a bit to expand also my introduction, that there is a context also with the exchange among different institutions with the FH Hagenberg and uh, for the uh, initiators of this symposium. Thank you very much for this opportunity to get into a deeper networked exchange on topics of the experiment with Ludus, the game. That's why I say Ludic. Your pronunciation is best, better than mine, Michael. <laughs> I always call it Ludic because Ludus, the Latin terms, shows us this hybrid Ludic play. It's the Ludic something where playfulness is inherent. This image that you see here was the kickoff um, of the first year of the study department where we have now a virtual walkthrough the environment uh, of PSK, of a former saving banks in Vienna, which is a Gesamtkunstwerk of Otto Wagner, which is the home of our study department. But it also shows the hybrid ludic assemblage, the play and combinatory forms of hybrid objects that deal with nature and the deeper understanding of the world. In the base, you already see now uh, installation from Marlene Mautner, decolonizing the decolonized Mars. It is um, using an AI generated environment where the textures mirror the interface. So, this is also a 3D interface where the audience interacts with a physical ch gesture with the environment and also a bacteria play a role in this environment where the bacteria change later on the environment of a fictional planet B, let's say, on Mars, but they don't want to colonize, it wants to decolonize. How is that possible? Maybe with a sound environment that is from Sebastian Scholz, another student who is actually now doing a piece together with a writer, Barbie Markovic. You see her in the virtual piece car in this walkthrough walk of the Saving Banks Hall, which is transparent like a spaceship. So this is really mirroring our real space, going into the texture of Malene again, a collective playable environment also. And they made an audio piece with um, a connection to different topics, clouds. 
So GPD-2 generated cloud animators that mirror also certain developments on the planet, but in physical space and in virtual space, with bacteria resistance and uh, a hybrid interface. That's the hybrid ludic play, not only analog, physical, digital, but also the nature, nature and environment. So a collective play through a prototype of the first year students of experimental game cultures, something that I show as intro, a work from Daniela Weiss, Lito you see with a mirror, um, on the left Maxim Sharpov, modeling the Kreml, seeing how hollow it is inside. Daniela shows performances in real space where she walks through an environment with a mirror on her face, where she mirrors reality with a simple analog mirror, but also with an augmented reality show that uh, and a um, museum, the artificial museum project that she also co-developed with Yasha Ehrenreich. The last statement I give to um, the to Babi Markovic, a writer of an interesting book she showed at the Ludic Method Surrey, mirroring the Belgrade waterfront, which is more for virtual beings than for real humans. It only is for ideal people. In Belgrade, normal people cannot afford it. Only the successful uh, blonde kids of some people, whom I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So you see mixing environments and mirroring realities, point one. This is part of the hybrid ludic assemblage. The concept of assemblage, uh, it's not exactly what Manuel de Landa is writing where, is he refer where he is referring also to an expanded Marxist concept that connects different social realities also with um, a, a natural nature reality. It also means the assemblage of situationism, Dadaism, of artistic strategies. This assemblage allows the connection of art, scientific approaches, and socially relevant action. In hybrid game assemblage, in prototypes of experimental game culture, we focus on the conscious exchange of established dynamics of world of the game. I don't use the term mechanics, I use game dynamics, because dy dynamics, a dynamic system is in a game, but it's also mirroring the world. It's also in a living system, in ludic arrangements between human and non-human actants. This is an interesting uh, configuration, the actor network theory, the ant <laughs> theory, where you have humans and non-humans. Who are these non-humans? It can be AI, it can be robot, but it can be also other non-human animals, living bacteria. What you want to see is a, a question where you want to go with that, the second one. So the preparation and the kickoff of the real space with the situative drone game that started in October last year. So we are very new at the Angewandte Vienna with that, where I'm, you see, curating pieces, facilitating pieces. I see some of the students also here. I will also show some works then. But this was the kickoff where we had a drone play. The idea was new students come, everyone gets a play drone, and there is only one rule. In this Gesamtkunstwerk, take the drum, but don't touch the ceiling, and then improvise a situated game. Play with the situation and play with the space. Touching the Gesamtkunstwerk, don't touch the ceiling. And also, what does it mean to look through a throne and to use the device of war as a toy? It was before the war started that we have now, but in June we did a second version of the drone game with drones and rabbits where we were taking up the topic to develop game changer concepts. Yeah? The game changing is a wordplay, but game changer concepts are an aim to achieve with hybrid ludic apps, assemblage. <coughs> Processual play and epistemic objects form a new method of inquiry. So, the process of play is also a method to question, to question realities and to question certain topics that you want. Play itself is a research method. In times of global challenges, especially, the ludic method, as I call it, sheds light on dynamic change. 
because we deal with complex, very subtle dynamic systems, both in politics, as in nature, as in life, as in play. <laughs> there is a, a link for this free play within science and society that opens economic zero-sum games. Because very often an aim is a zero-sum game. In the end, there is the winner takes it all. If somebody wins, somebody has to lose. What happens if we want to introduce different forms of economics, of economic play? With the equilibrium, that is possible also in um, Wirtschaft theory, in economic theories, in mathematical game theories. The Nash equilibrium was introduced quite early, but nobody took up other Wirtschaft's um, economic theories. There was only one capitalist logic that is mirrored in, I'm looking forward to Isabel afterwards, in, in the non-colonial, decolonial play mechanisms. That's what I want to touch also with this group of young artists that we start here to analyze. In this, we change the game rules in democratic negotiation, negotiation into game changer concepts of cooperation and entanglement with matter. Sounds abstract, but you have seen an example already how we can connect with the matter, with living matter, with the matter uh, and materiality, the vibrant matter of everything, of a controller, for example. A new experimental game culture explores, what do we explore? Rules of play. It develops artistic research systems of investigation and knowledge acquisition an open-ended micro and macrocosmic dynamic that replaces game mechanics in the artistic research process. The fundamentals of perception, experience, and cognition are equally considered as elements of fact-finding, informing essential questions on the condition of world and verträgliches Sein. I don't translate it as sustainability, as the term sustainability itself is problematic. Because sustainability means you regrow a wood because you need <laughs> new trees to fire a steam engine. That's how the word sustainability was introduced in the 1900s as an economic concept. That's why I use verträgliche sein, which means we understand each other. Not sustaining necessarily a system that we don't want to have anymore or shouldn't have anymore at the time of planet B again. A new angle on all these players is showed in this um, approach that I present here. The movie I'm showing now uh, is a piece with, uh, I did with Thomas Wagensommer, where we were using this location that we are having as home of our endeavor of the Experimental Game Cultures Project. This is this uh, 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 Jugendstil, saving banks, and f by flying over the photogrammetry, we are using, of course, a ready-made photogrammetry of Google. So it's a question about using and using appropriated material. We aim here on certain keywords. At the same time, innovative game concepts and approaches shall be developed. Realities often need to collapse in order to further develop uh, something in a historical societal context that cannot so quickly be changed, but needs to be reflected to better understand this, democratically shape these futures. Non-colonial play game, games for non-humans developing content, and here the dystopic environment hits the reality, which is much more beautiful. This is the team of experimental game cultures at the moment. We started with a 3D scan of all the collaborators in the group. And each, I see Jogi Neufeld here, I see some of the team members as well. Every, each of you stated what is experimenting with game and cultures. What is it in terms of politics, economics, and play? And why is this so central in the present time? 
So new forms of future society and politics might emerge with a very powerful tool that we all hold in our hands. Each of us becomes a game figure in this environment and has a, a iconic object that we associate with. And uh, the film was also showed in, the, um, in Hellerau at the Hybrid Play Festival. So hybrid is a term very present in the last year, I noticed. Our way there is the game. So der Weg ist das Spiel. Our way to achieve these uh, interventions, these activist points, is the game itself. And to develop new artistic and playful concepts. So what does it mean if we are all scammed into a, our avatar that is linked to our body? These are topics that we, I also want to discuss with the colleagues. If we, excuse me, are we human then anymore? What does it mean if we mirror ourselves in reality and merge with our fictional avatars? It's very interesting that there is a, a quest for consistency, often also because you want to be sure, for sure you want to be safe in a virtual environment. What does it mean if I'm really linking it to the real names, to the real bodies? Is this necessary? Is this derive detourment of this freedom not even better if we are those prosumers. I stop here and go to the next thing, what we do. So after one year, the first year, what I did, I was entering the Kassenhalle again with a PhD student of mine, with Sarko Alekšić, a young a writer and emerging artist uh, from Zagreb, and we were doing nothing. Zero actions in the saving banks, a sweet little do-nothing performance without rules in unconscious and unintentional, passive, ludic, neuromatic art. A simultaneous hyperscan with the EEG, the electroencephalogram, um, was um, part of the game device, of the performative device. So you see the space itself becomes a game space. We are lying a bit uh, mirroring, I don't know, Abramovich performance or so, looking to each other in different positions of, of course, hierarchy and power. This is the PhD student, but is he the artist mirroring me or I'm what position I am there lying down on the bed? And then also seeing the unintentional micro-movements of the feet, of the heart, and do we synchronize with our brain activity if we are lying there? The configuration was um, monitored. So what you see here is then the activity, the brain activity of the two curves. And if certain areas of the cerebral activity, activity are synchronizing, so I also synchronize different areas of my brain, but I also connected certain moments, so that's the same moment here, with the brain of the other protagonist, of the other player. With a, that's called a passive interface. You have seen some of these brain-computer interfaces are passive interfaces. I think that's an interesting concept. It was developed together with Stefan Glas, our neuroscientist at the BTU Cottbus, a computational neuroscientist professor who was writing the visualization um, and the, um, analyzing the big amount of data that we also connected here. But it is a low interaction game. It only has the minimal interaction of starting being there. And then also that's what speculators do in the saving banks, doing nothing. That's what speculation is. And that's what the symbolic um, statement in the saving bank, in the place where we have the hybrid ludic assemblage, where you have nature, games beyond commercial games industries, experimenting with world and reality, with the economic, biologic concepts, and also with game changer concepts, where we want to focus on our empathic living together. At the moment, with the same title, there is a show at the Parallel Art Fair, if you are still in Vienna. The students are showing pieces there where um, the hybrid ludic assemblage is essential. At the Semmelweis cleaning, which is a Semmelweis, Ignaz Semmelweis was um, a 
developing also concept of antiseptics. It was very important for the birth um, giving because the women died because they didn't know about the antiseptic thing. And that's what Semmelweis was changing. And in this Semmelweis clinic, we have no installation. A birth clinic is giving place to the Vienna Art Fair Parallel and also to the nascent experimental game cultures out of the young colleagues there. So you see the, some of the pieces I mentioned already. You see the <coughs> Little System Collective, the mirror on the wall. What is the future of us all? That's an augmented reality piece on the left hand, where she analyzes what is the future of us all. A game over replay is a virtual voting system asking visitors to predict future. Check out the virtual reality. It's a very interesting piece. Also, um, I picked out the water bottle dream from Adrian Heim. It is a mixed machinima digital game. The work, work focuses on the impossibility of imagining an alternative world in the current historical situation. Um, that is something that is described also in capital realism. Adrian is also a member of the Total Refusal Group, showing here also at the Ars Electronica. I mentioned already the Erythrobacteria piece. But here you see it's not only a virtual piece, it, this is a symbolic piece mixed with a machinima. You have a water bottle standing there exemplarily for water as a problem. You press Please the game button. Press X to change the water. Press X to change the water. The water will be changed after 4 minutes and 12 seconds. This is the Artificial Museum, the game over replay of Lito. The, the art fair visitors, not knowing that they are in a game environment, but then knowing if they also see the lunar lander again, Mars lander. <laughs> the Mars escape is very present here. But um, yeah, it is a topic that you you have um, at the end of times to escape the planet, very obviously. So. Um, before you enter this installation, we have a Kopfgeld installation, also a bit announcing the um, learning mechanisms or the deep learning mechanisms. It is a face recognition system, um, which I set up with the research group that we call Neuromatic Game Art uh, Group. Um, it is about Eigenfaces. The Mittelwert image, the Eigenface, is calculated out of all visitors. It were over 1,000 visitors at the Parallel 2019. This inspired us for the piece where we generate a new image, a new image of all visitors, a fake face, so to say. It resembles the, the ludic eigenface, transfers into score. as It resembles the visitor, but it is fictionally made, so it's not the real visitor. It is like a AI method that you compile of a database an artifact that resembles a reality. So we also cannot be really sued for taking the images of visitors, but if somebody does, it would be very good, then we would have some publicity. On the other hand, the ludic eigenface is transferred into a score. The score is derived from the face of the visitor, from the art collector. The score is in then calculated into euro and then with the live um, currency of Bitcoin. And this is the price that the visitor can pay for the art pieces. So you're pr you are paying anyway with your face, and then you pay uh, that's whatever is your score. So your reward is that you are allowed to pay a certain amount of bitcoins. You, <laughs> that's the installation view. You check out, you see it resembles my, my face, probably it's not really me, but it's my eigenface, it's the middleware images, and you are mixed with a database of AAA game characters. So the faces you are 
rented out are not only visitors, art collectors, but also AAA game characters. They give the price of pieces from uh, the, the students exhibit, exhibiting in this environment. So that is the aspect of the critical view on games, where the Neuromatic Game Art Research Labs is exemplary to develop these exp pan not expanded but deep animations with neural interfaces, a source and constant feedback tool or toy. We I aim to introduce game changer games. I give to you also this invitation with uh, an image of uh, Clementina Ristova. She has uh, installation about skins and the skins also as a form of uh, the skins in games as a form of um, prejudice, as a form of discrimination. I give it through the audience and you can take one afterwards. She is present as well here. So Clementina, just uh, she's going to explain some of these works if you want to know more about it. We think hard and reflect deeply also in, in uh, live sessions at art contexts like this uh, performance with the Pink Noise Brain Jam session to see something of my background, where I also pink noise is a term that is li like gra uh, so weißes Rauschen, like white noise or gray noise, pink noise, has a science fiction connotation at the Vienna Art Week last year, where we also mirror the reflection as visual material. So this is the direct visual feedback to the interface of optimizing and analyzing yourself. What does it mean if I have the impression that I can measure and optimize also my, my very deep inner thoughts and self with neuro interfaces that are available for consumer markets? That's a vibrant question to see all the interfaces at the brink. And the point here was that this is based on a constant series as a not only performative settings, as we had lockdown. Um, uh, here I'm washing the electrodes at the end. This is a beautiful wet electrode, which is different to other electrodes that you cannot wash. And it is a reference to the WEC, to the Women's Action Coalition, where you are doing like housework, sustainable work, washing electrodes. That's what the PhD students normally do. I do it at the performance myself. So. And it gives a very good sound. Um, this is broadcasted and you are forced to listen to that if you check the broadcast of the Neuromatic uh, Game Art Channel. We did Neuromatic Chess Madness with student participation with Regina teisel Bocorner. She is a, Regina is a grandmaster and she was playing a European grandmaster of chess and she was playing against 24 players simultaneously and we were changing a film about chess madness from 1924 with the data of the player. Uh, Enrique Dores, who founded the Entstehung einer künstlerischen Tatsache, he is also a student at the Angewandte but an initiator of an art science program in Jena. He played against her and 24 other players with him. And they not only played, they were shifting the rules of a game that you you cannot shift the rules of chess if you still want to play chess. But you can generate a movie while you play chess if you are equipped with the right attitude and the right interface, so to say. And generating mind clouds with electrodes are uh, backgrounds of my mind cloud pieces. This I want to say as final statement, I would say. Wie viele Minuten? Five? Okay, so I'm good in time. Where um, with mind cloud climate change, last year in June at the Angewandte Festival, before the experimental game culture started, I did a meditation in the office. It still was lockdown, but I could generate certain number of clouds following the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, theta frequency bands in like different rainbow colors. It was Pride Month also um, of the clouds I generated in the performance in my office. So that was an office performance. But it could be transferred into public spaces, also problematic public spaces. I finish with, with the mind cloud clearing in times of war and peace. Experiment in March, <coughs> shown at the beginning of the war in Ukraine. 
and also referring to the fog of war that Clausewitz is mentioning. As soon as war breaks out, everything is indeterminate. This nebulous indeterminacy is in the challenge to which we must respond. It's what Alexander Kluge said on the 1st of March of this year. And at the Biennale de Havana, I uh, started together um, with uh, Stefan here, an installation with this interface with the Odra deck, an uh, object that is animated. Franz Kafka introduced this. This is an object which gets life. And this object, the copper sword helmet that we developed here with Talos Kedel, a uh, uh, sculpture, gets a life in reflecting the mirrors, the fog, <laughs> the clouds, of war and physical realities that we are confronted with in a symbolic level. That is at the Fundacion Ludwig de Cuba this year, so where you see the public performance. I would love to show more art pieces to you from the students and colleagues, but I think more will come up. The um, exhibition at Parallel is still open. We connect also with mycelium words. This is from Ramon y Jajal, a nerve cell, but it also reminds me very much of a mycelium cell. That's why I overgrew the electrodes with mycelium of a reishi fungus in the lab, in the office, and we were also evaluating these signals that came out of the interfaces between life and death, and that's uh, what also fungi do, they are between life and death, connecting the different hybrid play realities. Thank you for this collective performance watching. This is the performance at the Festspielhaus Hellerau in October of the last year, where we started the Mind Cloud Copper Helmet Meditations, I think. Ah, here you can see the group more clearly. This is the audience trying to influence on stage the instruments. And I would say... As a tribute to Laurie Anderson, who saw yesterday the presentation, a vocodo performance that I had there last year in October. Thank you. Mind cloud growing, mind cloud clearing. The global ludic art is critical reflection, animation, and the ambiguity as a quality in play. A new understanding of the global challenges of our, of our time can emerge out of it. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thanks, Margarete, for this inspiring talk. Um, we have now a um, couple of minutes for questions. So, yeah. So, are there questions from the audience? Please raise your hands if you have one. Okay. Um, yeah, I have, I have a question. In the meantime, people can think about other questions. Um, what I was thinking about, since you mentioned um, um, this kind of EEG, these brain interfaces, and you mentioned that they, they um, enable some kind of passive interaction. Mm -hmm. So um, what, how, how do you, um, as, as, as I see it, this kind of passive interaction entails a little bit a uh, lack of control. So there are certain signals that you cannot perfectly control. Do you see um, also dangers behind this? So when a user, so to say, or a player doesn't have the full control over, the, over a game, or how do you um, yeah, see this kind of situation when you're using a, some kind of a brain interface? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting take, I would say. 
Let's get ludic with the experimental EEG. Showing the EEG again, it entails some possibilities. Also if we have these passive interfaces, it teaches us something. I had to learn when doing these installations that I cannot control what happens really. That, that, that's the, the wrong, I have to say it's the wrong approach trying to move a ball with the EEG. Why? What, why should I drive a plane with the EEG? There is also a project for, about which is doing that. It is much better to understand that even if I cannot control, and if the aim is not to control an environment, then I can also learn there is a different approach to reality, a different approach to human brain waves, and to the connection to lay down, to reflect, and that you don't always need to control environment. You need to become aware of it. And it looks like a state of meditation because it partly is a state of meditation. That's why I walk in the wood with the EEG. No, it's no danger. It is a potential that you understand that you are not following the command control communication guideline, not necessarily if you want to change an attitude to the world. We don't have to change the world all the time. Yeah, you should as many interesting examples that uh, you utilize this, this, kind yeah. of this piece of technology. You know, yeah. that is this <laughs> working. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, is this working? So, can I follow on your thought maybe that um, lack of control is maybe not a game anymore. Yeah. So you, you have interesting performances, but I'm wondering when you say this is a game or this is a performance, or is, is it the same for you? Because no, I think not. lack of control is no game. Is a strategy, some scores or something? Yeah. I think. Well, I would say there is um, a tendency also, low interaction games. They are really entering the market. There's a reason for it. Because we want to change the pressure of you submit, you, you are, you are, you prosumer, you upload. It's no more a game, but it's for sure an experimental game or a ludic intervention. That's why I was so much word playing also with it. It's not the same, but it's not also just the performance. It is having more rules and dealing with the rules. And having this experience, what does it mean? If I follow a rule, I can gain something sometimes. And it still is playable. I don't agree that art and uh, games necessarily means that I can no more play. Yeah? Also, this, I'm not, uh, if people say, oh, it's not playable, okay, it's art. No, that's not the case. <laughs> No, that's not the case. It's playing with the game system. But you're right, it's no more a game in the sense of achieving that goal in that way. It has a new way of achieving some things. Yeah. But not only about interaction. Interaction not, doesn't necessarily reflect the rules so much that you give. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit, this, therefore, hybrid, a bit. Uh, <laughs> it has, interaction doesn't necessarily need needs the dynamic, or does it? Ne does it need the, uh, it's an open question. We can discuss, you're right, yeah. But a bit more focus on the dynamic of get, getting deeper into the, into the dynamic. Expanding the interaction, maybe. Expanding the animation, maybe, yeah. Thanks, yeah. I think one more. Um, I was wondering, a few of the projects that you showed had a bit of a lo-fi, sort of low-poly aesthetic, the student projects. I was wondering if there was any artistic intent behind that that you could care to explain. Yeah, maybe Clementina, you want to explain? I think she should say something to it. Um, do you hear me? Okay. So well, on one hand, um, we s many of us started without any previous experience with game engines, um, and just for a year we already had were able to create games and play with the interactions and be able to program them. Um, and when you're trying to learn how to use game mechanics, sometimes the mm, the very hyper realistic aesthetics are not your purpose because you're trying to achieve some sort of interaction and follow your concept rather than creating a beautiful image, if, 
if that makes sense. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Clementina. Also, at least Clementina's is very much dealing with not polygon surfaces, so it's much advanced. It is not, if you are asking, it's not a given that, we say, that I would say or somebody else polygon is the thing to go. Because this is also a tendency. I love the pixel aesthetics, of course, because you feel cozy at home. <laughs> I feel cozy at home. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, maybe that's a question then of, um, of your personal history also. But it's not like a program. A as Clementina said, I would support it. It is like a secondary question. The aesthetics that suits your purpose best would be the answer. But uh, you like it, the, the pixel aesthetics, personally? <laughs> right. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> OK, thank you. I think we have another question. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm Alexandro. I was curious, it's here. Uh, so. You showed at the end of the presentation some performances, I think, where the EEG headset was used uh, on, uh, not on the head. I was curious uh, if, you, mm -hmm. uh, if you could uh, explain or what's the meaning or the purpose of this or... The one not on the head or those not, on the head? Not, not on the head, <laughs> right. Yeah. Of course, it's playful, but what's the meaning, or what would yeah. we get out of it? Yeah. <coughs> Stefan? So, this is the neuroscientist answering. Well, to a certain extent, it's a kind of a repurposing of a device. So, you have a device which, which is made for use, to be used to record brain waves, but you can also use it for other things. You put it on something else, you try to influence it with, with your hands, with basically with the magnetic fields that are created by your hands. So you can, you can turn it into a, into a different thing. You are repurposing it. So that, that's, that's the kind of thing which we wanted to do. We wanted to see what comes out of it. If you put it, we try to put it on a plant, for example. Yeah. Yeah? We wanted to try to, to see what, what what does but, it but do? Is it like yeah. a special meaning in using the EEG headset? Why not use a ah, specific, uh, mm -hmm. because it's about electric potentials? Mm -hmm. And yep. uh, I'm curious if you relate this type of work with some uh, yeah. uh, neuroscience studies, like doing fMRIs on dead fish and showing mm. significant results. I think there's one also on EEG with yeah. spinach or something. That could be. I, 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 know, I know the study from the, the fMRI with the dead fish, of course. Yeah. That, it, it was not the primary intention, intention here, but it's, it is one of the intentions here also to show that if you do that EEG stuff, you're not always recording brain waves, of course. You're recording a lot of other things too. So you're recording muscle muscle activity, you are recording other kind of artifacts. So all that stuff which, which, which you actually don't want to use, but in this art context, you can use it again. Yeah? In this art context, it's something different. You don't have to rely on just recording brain waves. You can do something else with it. Yeah. So the artifact becomes an artifact. You are factoring out as scientist and with working with the um, even with fMRI and the electrodes, you are factoring out artifacts. Artifact is the term for disturbances in all the data. You have to get rid of the artifacts in the data. And here in the art context, we have the Neuromatic Game Art Research Group. We work with the artifacts. So also with the noise and the muscle data, etc. And of course, you're right, we could have used other electrodes. yeah, But uh, it was symbolic act using this expensive EEG data also on a symbolic level, which is meant to analyze brain data. Uh, Stefan is working also with dead fish brain, <laughs> yes, but it was not about this as, as a core topic. It was about this uh, intervention to develop a sort of theremin, a, a toy, a play with uh, instrument with a scientific instrument that has a meaning for us. Yeah, I was criticized and attacked at the last art fair when I was showing this um, 
I didn't show the whole installation, but we made a physical game over three spaces, over, over three rooms, yeah, where you had the first room, a measurement, and then it was used as a stimulus, the face, with an oddball experiment. So it was a game of prejudice if your brain would react to a strange face, to an AI face or a real face. But I was accused, do you have a neuroscientific degree? Are you allowed to use that? Um, I was at the postgraduate school at the LMU Munich at the Neuroscience Institute, but I don't have a neuroscientific degree. I collaborate with neuroscientists. I had the Sarah Sharisian, she was doing the experiment at the last art fair. But it is a symbolic artifact, that object also that we use. That's why we Thank use you. it. Thank yeah. you for the question. F thank you for your input. Good uh, point. Yeah, uh, I feel we are now out of time for this. I really like this vivid thank discussion. You. Thank um, you very much. Indeed. Thank you, Mar Margarete, one more time for this cool talk. Thanks. <laughs> okay, um, we get uh, to our next talk in the games and art session. Um, this talk will be held by Isabelle Arrer, a French artist and curator whose research focuses on the interaction between art and video games. And in her talk, Reoccupy the Digital Space, she introduces games as a tool to criticize games themselves and to raise awareness on post-colonial political and social issues. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Isabella Ver, I'm an art and game curator. And today I'm gonna speak about the idea of reoccupying the digital space. And I'm really happy to be here and thanks Jorgen uh, for inviting me at uh, Expanded Animation because for me, to be part of uh, the digital art maker is really important when you speak about the idea of reoccupying the digital space. So, uh, just to give you a little bit of context, um, in the 90s, while I was discussing with uh, teenagers, they told me that they were dreaming in video games, that they love so much video games that they would prefer to live inside games. And when I heard that, I realized that games <clears throat> were a very serious matter and that if they were able to shape our imaginary, they would be also able to manipulate people's minds. So from that time, I started to highlight and promote alternative, artistic, and more experimental games in order to show the other side of video game production, aside from the big names, the big triple A uh, games industry. And that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. Uh, mostly in Europe, in the US, in Canada, in Australia, and showing content from the same part of the world. And also I'm known for, uh, for my interest into machinima. I gave a lot of machinima workshops around the world. And more I was traveling, more I saw that everywhere in the world we were playing the same big name of games, the same triple A games. So that's why, uh, to celebrate my uh, 20 years as an art and game curator, I decided to start an art and game world tour in the Global South. Uh, it was in 2019. And uh, the idea was to meet and interview game makers and uh, artists who are using games as a medium in Global South countries with a focus on female, queer, feminist, and decolonial practices. So, so far, I've been in Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, Thailand, Japan, India, Colombia, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, then in Nigeria, and I was in Ghana when the pandemic started, so I succeeded to pass to Togo. And then I did a project in Kenya and then in Senegal, where I've been uh, most of my time uh, this year. 
along my journey. I gave a lot of uh, lectures, uh, machinima workshops, where I was using the games that I encountered during my journey um, in order to work on uh, intercultural storytelling and also uh, to disseminate along the way uh, and promote experimental and alternative games around the world and also uh, to have the chance to meet uh, creatives uh, during the workshop. So why uh, the colonial perspective? Uh, the, go global, uh, the global gaming market is still very dominated by the US, Europe and Japan and so my idea uh, in adopting a uh, decolonial perspective uh, was um, in order to promote works conceived at the periphery of this global and globalizing culture in order to allow us to immerse ourselves in other types of representation, cities, landscapes, stories, cosmogonies, also conceived and expressed, not every all the time, but in other languages. So my point was to accompany and to promote the emergence of a market of contents from the global south, which is a recent phenomenon, let's say uh, we can speak of the last 10 years, um, that, um, that is linked to uh, the rise of the mobile phone and internet, but also thanks to a very, very large uh, young population in the global south uh, countries. Thanks to that, uh, new voices are emerging and are able to reappropriate the narratives on themselves in order not to be anymore an exotic uh, context, but rather the own e enunciation of their uh, representation. So very quickly, the Art and Game World Tour in numbers. Uh, I, I already said that I went in 15 countries. Uh, in every country I visited, I did uh, around 20 to 30 interviews. So, so far I, I, I encountered more than 300 uh, persons. I wrote articles, gave machinima workshops, uh, conferences, but also um, curated exhibitions. The last one was in uh, Nairobi, in Kenya, where I showed only uh, VR experiences and games from the African uh, continent. I also tried to, um, to do like um, artistic collaborations, uh, because the idea was also to find other way of to exchange uh, and to uh, work with uh, local artists. So I was VJ. Uh, showing games in another type of context. And uh, lately, I did um, a collaboration with a game designer in Senegal, and I'm just back from, from it two days ago. And we, we were working on a 3D film about, uh, the name is Virtual Tree, and it's about the supernatural powers and medicinal powers of uh, trees. So talking about Planet B. There are many things over there. So the aim is to be able to create another type of cartography of queer, feminist, and decolonial uh, art and games, and uh, to highlight uh, neglected territories, and to identify and valorize cultural, social, and economic circulations and transfers, and to create a raison corpus of video games created in the South. So let's reoccupy the digital art and game space. So I would say that we assist to a counterattack of the minorities, which paves the way uh, to a reappropriation of the image and of the representation and the identities. And thanks to that, uh, it counters the screen globalization of a globalized imaginary. Uh, I take this idea to uh, Joseph Tonda, uh, who is from Brazzaville, he's a sociologist. Instead of talking about La Société du Spectacle de Guy Debord, it's also a way to decolonize the thinking. And uh, this decolonization of uh, im the imaginary invites a new generation of game and digital creators to question other cosmologies and cosmogonies. And I will try to show you some games that are uh, mixing supernatural and everyday life, 
because fantasy is not only from the West. Uh, <laughs> there are also uh, other possible fantasies outside of the North, let's say. So I will start with a game uh, made by uh, Daniela Fernandez. Uh, she's uh, Argentinian, uh, but uh, she's also a descendant of the Guaranis, who are uh, in the, uh, an indigenous uh, population uh, in the north of um, uh, Argentina, but also in Brazil. And she wanted to do an autobiographic game uh, about her family, her home sisters. And she says that um, uh, all the creation comes from her dreams, and also that her ancestors are talking to her through her dreams, and that's where the inspirations come from. So you were talking about non-human. <laughs> it is also a discussion with uh, non-human. Then uh, Daniela also did um, another game uh, more recently, Light Aksai, and uh, she refers to the Toba mythology, uh, actually, it's a platformer uh, game that she did around the, um, the story of the black tree. And um, the black tree in the Toba mythology uh, had to be climbed by um, shamans um, and in order to save and to help uh, their community. So in Lydaxai, um, Lyda wants to become a shaman. Uh, in order to be able to find a way to save her village from a very, very strange disease. It was done during the pandemic, so we can somehow also link the, the game to the context. In somehow the same um, idea, I would like to introduce the game Huni Queen that was done by Guillaume Pino Menenes with the Uni Queen who lived uh, in, um, in, in, in Brazil. And for me, what is interesting is that, again, uh, Uni Queen are not the context of, uh, of, the, of the game, but it's really a game done by uh, the persons themselves. So they did the drawings, they, um, all the story were uh, written by them. They also uh, played the music. And it's not only about doing a game with the Uni Queen, but it was also uh, part of a, a larger project uh, in order to uh, sustain uh, the Uni Queen uh, from the, and to avoid uh, too much deforestation and extractive economy. Still in Brazil, um, I had the chance to meet Ricardo Ruiz, who did a, a very interesting uh, project, again, in terms of the process of how it was done. Uh, Contos de Ifa is about all the Yoruba deities, um, the, 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 the beliefs uh, imported by the slaves from uh, West Africa in, in Latin America. And when I say that the process was quite interesting, um, this game, which is an online game, was done during uh, workshops um, mixing uh, elderly people, talking about uh, their beliefs, the Yoruba deities, um, and ancestrality. And then the teenagers were doing the game um, after that. And I think it's quite um, interesting in terms of the process. Uh, still in Brazil and still about the uh, Yoruba um, deities, um, I met a group of students from the Alumbe Mohumbi uh, University in Sao Paulo. And they, also, uh, they were also working on the, on the game about IFA. Uh, the FA is the, um, how, how do we say, is the, OK. I, I, I don't remember the, the word in English, but uh, I, uh, anyway. Um, so this game is. It's not French. No, but it doesn't come. 
So it's a game that is more close to the uh, uh, Metroidvania. And this time, the students, only few of them were um, uh, Afro-descendants. So they went to, um, to a house of uh, Candomblé in order to, to, to produce the game. But the, the aim was also to make more known uh, these beliefs. So the idea also behind the reoccupying the digital space is to propose other type of gameplays, and maybe which are less about confrontation uh, and competition, but more about collaboration, and maybe the idea of symbiosis with dif different forms of life, and collective sharing of different modes of reality but also picturing other types of women bodies, less gendered and sexualized, also maybe less violence and more female characters. So I will start with uh, the game Awa that is still in development um, uh, by the studio Kaifo in Senegal which is a game that is based on the Serer co cosmology. So the Serers are uh, one of the uh, main uh, um, population. They somehow founded uh, Dakar. And uh, their cosmology is really related to the stars. And Awa, the main character, has to fight uh, in between the bad and the good. And also, uh, when I talk with the script uh, of the, of the scriptwriter of the game, she said that she really wanted to, uh, to represent a character that is not, um, let's say, too gendered and not sexualized at, at, at all. And also, like, a common woman uh, who is trying to do her best uh, to help again her village. Everyone is using. Uh, in Kenya, um, uh, something interesting, there are like two trainings for games. Uh, one is at the Kenyan Technical University. And uh, from what I, I, I saw, uh, the, the curriculum is quite um, focusing on uh, cultural and political uh, project. Uh, and I met uh, Agnes Ndewa, who, is, who was working on Lika the Journey. And uh, the idea is to raise awareness on women conditions, first in Maasai uh, tribes, but also in other different uh, cultures in Africa. So this game is about uh, excision, but also the condition of women. And uh, it's also still in development. <laughs> and um, again, with a, a, a main character, a female uh, game character, um, I interviewed um, Lome Studio in Madagascar. I wasn't able to, to go there. And they produced the game Dahalo. And it's a game uh, based on true facts. Uh, there, there is a huge problem with the, the Zebu uh, thieves uh, in the south of the island. Uh, now it's almost becoming a, a, a civil war, and uh, villages are destroyed. And when I asked them why they choose the, um, a female character, they told me that uh, most of the men are dead, and now it's the women who are like defending the villages. And also, they told me, uh, so it's a team of four persons. They wanted to do a triple A game, but uh, maybe they weren't uh, enough people to, to succeed. But um, so they also told me that they put a lot of attention on the body and on the representation of this main character uh, because they really wanted to make a a change, because most of the time, as you know, in mainstream games, we have big tits, and, but it's changing, hopefully. <laughs> um, 
it's not only uh, about raising um, awareness on political or social issues, but also on environmental issues. And it goes very well with the green gaming movement that is uh, somehow uh, rising uh, nowadays. Maybe it's about greenwashing, but still it's quite interesting because um, there are more and more uh, call to actions in the favor of the environment uh, inside game. So um, in some part of the global south, uh, games are like dealing also with the, the, the question of uh, the environment. And I also think that games are a good tool to, um, <clears throat> uh, to raise awareness um, on the idea of uh, to disalienate and to rehabilitate the history. And not the history of the winners, but the stories of those who lived uh, the event and are now able to tell them. But... In order to be able to tell other kind of stories, the thing that we have to remember, most of the game engines, like uh, if we think about Unreal or uh, Unity, as most of the games are done in some part of the world, if we think about the, the assets libraries, most of them are dealing with Western uh, representation and Western history. So when you want to create a game outside of this world, you need to somehow, I don't know if the, it exists in English, but you can reinvent the wheel because you have to create from scratch everything. So when I was in Lagos in Nigeria, I met Ushena who wanted to work for all the, the other game designers by um, creating uh, with photogrammetry or 3D scans, a lot of assets related to African culture. But if we think about that, and if you want to, uh, for example, uh, 3D scan a sculpture or a mask, most of the time you cannot do that because uh, they are in a European museum and they don't let you uh, the access to this uh, artifact. So it's quite political, um, uh, this, uh, this issue. Now um, Ushena is doing uh, animation and, and game design, but at that time he saw that it was important to develop uh, assets for other people. Um, we can go back to, uh, <laughs> to Brazil, um, and I will quote uh, Jamila Ribeiro when she said that it would be quite interesting if uh, the story of slavery uh, could be told by, uh, uh, from another point of view, and not from the one who conquered, uh, but from the one uh, who had to live with the situation. So, this game, Angola Janda, is uh, made by a, a, a duo, Suze Real. Uh, they are in Sao Paulo. And it's based on the, on the book uh, um, Angola Janda, a story of uh, Palmares. And it tells the story of these slaves who escaped uh, from the plantation and went to the Quilombos, some villages. And the idea is also to represent um, the slaves not as victims, but also as heroes, and to change the perspective and to change the narrative. Um, in order to disalienate and to change the point of view, when I was in, uh, in Dakar, I met the, the um, studio uh, Amani Renas, and they are currently working on a, um, on a VR game, uh, Langaburi, which means uh, in Wolof of uh, hide and seek. And this game uh, is uh, happening uh, on the island of Gore, where you have the House of Slaves, and it's all about uh, the history of slavery, but this time, it's not told again by the conqueror, but uh, uh, it is in, totally inspired by uh, true stories. Actually, the, um, one of the, the art directors of this game has um, still his uh, grandmother, and she's uh, 112 years old. 
and she still has uh, she still has a good uh, voice and uh, and her head and everything. So she's able to tell all the stories from the colonization, from the post-colonial uh, era, and so. This time, it's not the biggest story, but uh, all the little stories that made the story. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's him who told me that um, this uh, African proverb, until lions uh, will have their own uh, historians, hunting stories can only sing the glory of the hunter, <laughs> which is somehow the same. Uh, in Ghana, there is one of the um, first uh, game studio. Uh, I think Letty Arts was the first uh, gaming studio uh, in Africa. They, it was founded by um, Aaron Tawa and another person in Kenya. And they are producing a franchise, uh, Africa's Legend. And when I met uh, Aaron Taiwa, he told me that when he was a kid, he was really like um, into uh, Marvel heroes and uh, uh, into comics. But then uh, he decided that maybe it was time to invent and to create heroes that wouldn't be linked to um, American culture, but based on uh, African history and mythology and cosmology. And um, so, for example, here you have a character uh, that uh, he's wearing kente. And very often when we speak about uh, African material, uh, fabric, uh, the wax, uh, actually it's not African because it's made in, uh, um, in Holland. So kente is a true <laughs> Ghanaian uh, fabric, so it's quite interesting to, voila. And then they, they created uh, heroes uh, based on uh, Maasai uh, culture, on Zulu culture, and, and, and so on. Because, as he told me, uh, uh, young uh, people in Africa really need um, to understand that it's also possible to be a hero <laughs> there and to have like uh, success stories. Uh, so it's one of his aim. Then, still in Ghana, I had the chance to meet uh, Afrane Makov who was uh, at the art school of Kumasi uh, at that time when I met him. And um, if we think about the planet B, uh, in Ghana you have the biggest uh, heat rash. Uh, so he wanted to address that question by doing some mobiles uh, like that from heat rash uh, and electronics um, uh, defunct uh, objects, and then he modelized uh, these uh, mobiles into 3D, and he did like an AR uh, VR uh, project, and this one is a game in which uh, you can wander. It's more like um, an explorative game where you can um, meet and apprehend the story of these defunct objects because he's interested into the relationship between humans and, uh, and their objects. Still in Ghana, and because we are like in the planet B uh, <laughs> subject, I uh, documented um, a game that was uh, created in the frame of Hunter Africa, a project by the Goethe Institute. And Chronicles of Klinu is a geolocalized uh, mobile game that I had the chance to, to play. So we went in this big e trash um, and uh, they did um, all a story about Klinu, who is a god who wants to save the planet uh, from uh, disappear, not to disappear, and uh, so we went. Uh, we went in this place, and the aim of the the game is to raise awareness about the environmental burdens of garbage and pollution. And yeah, 
it was really a, a, an experience uh, to be able to share this project with uh, somehow, uh, the, his name is uh, Prince Andrew, who was uh, the project manager of Chronicles of Klinu. Okay. Uh, in the Nairobi um, exhibition, Jibambe uh, Natek, um, I also presented this game, uh, Semblance, I think. Sorry. Yeah. No, it doesn't work anyways. I also presented that game, Semblance, uh, that deals with uh, African culture, nature, and also spirits, in which all the, the, the trees are portals. Uh, and in this platformer game, uh, which is one of the few games who, which was able to reach the global market, you can um, um, you can reshape everything. So the gameplay is quite interesting because you can reshape yourself and you can reshape all the platforms. And finally, I will end with two 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 other projects that are not games, but uh, it's because I had this conversation with Pamplemousse, who is um, a creative from uh, Dakar, when he told me that uh, when I saw that Germans were modeling Carapid, Carapid is one of the main um, uh, means of transportation uh, in Dakar. So that's the, what you, you can see here. So when he saw that uh, Germans were modeling carapids to put them on sale, he decided that it was urgent to reappropriate this space. And that's thanks to this interview that I uh, wrote uh, this paper about reoccupying the digital space. And that's him who told me about uh, Linda Dunia who is the, 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 the person still in Dakar who curated this first uh, NFT show. Uh, so it was in uh, 21. And the name is Cyber, Cyber Bat, because Bat in Wolof means uh, voices. And she's using NFT in order to find other means of funding and access to the metaverse for African artists. So, Really, it's thanks to that interview that I had the, 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 the idea of uh, this text and paper. And I will end with a slide that could be a transition for the next, uh, the next talk, uh, but uh, Philippe Pasquier, uh, with a project that is really like uh, starting now uh, in Senegal. Uh, the name is Grain, and it's about uh, gender and uh, responsible artificial intelligence in Africa, made by African people for African people. So when we talk about decolonizing uh, the, the digital space, uh, it's quite interesting to see how um, initiatives like that are uh, starting. And you can see behind uh, an, an artwork uh, generated by uh, artificial intelligence made by uh, Bosama Gosa in Nigeria. So to conclude, <laughs> uh, instead of demanding more representations in mainstream games, I think that it's necessary uh, for us as scholars, our cultural entrepreneurs, our curators, to highlight content uh, uh, produced from in the global south um, in order to better apprehend realities outside the hegemonic center and global cultural imperialism in digital content, and to be able to offer more diverse stories, representations of women, bodies, environment, and nature. And also, I didn't speak so much about it, but in order to occupy the virtual space, it's also interesting, and it's part of my current research, to mix uh, ancestral knowledge and uh, digital creation in order to allow different layers of realities and modalities of presence. 
Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. <laughs> Very interesting talk, and um, I really love the examples that you showed us. Um, many different um, games from many different cultures, so um, there are lots of things that I haven't heard of, so um, very nice. So um, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Hello. Uh, thank you for absolutely wonderful content. Um, I have a Call question. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a question um, that is talking about knowledge, uh, ways of knowing. Uh, thinking about the ways of knowing, the sensing, the sharing, the being, what would you, or what could you say about how the various cultures that you're encountering, how they are trying to create games which have already very stylized mechanisms while bringing in ways of knowing and ways of experiencing that reflect their own sort of concepts and ways of being and knowing. Mm. Yeah, some people told me, oh, but why uh, going on the direction of uh, Western culture with doing games and digital games? But um, I do believe that we can use digital technologies in order to highlight some uh, cultures and beliefs that have been invisibilized uh, and it's a good way to make them visible and also to be able to reach younger generation who are totally colonized, who don't speak their language anymore, who for them, their culture is becoming a folklore and not their own. So the point is to use these technologies, but in order to reach a uh, younger generation. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, for example, a, a game that was made in Taiwan, uh, Detention, that is dealing with, uh, so it's a horror game, but it's dealing with uh, uh, white uh, terror. And now it's used by, um, uh, by educators in schools to help the new generation to understand how it was when uh, Taiwan was not a democracy. So, um, and I, I just showed digital games, but of course there are like many, many, um, uh, come on, the, the jeux de plateau, um, board games uh, that are produced uh, and that are not like uh, digital. So, yeah, um, they try to imagine other type of gameplays, as I said, but still, it's using the, um, I don't know if I am, well, answered your question. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I have the next one. Um, First of all, also thank you so much for, for the amazing presentation. I want to play all of the games. I think I took a picture of every single slide you, you had. Um, um, my question is maybe continuing a little bit from the previous question. Um, the example you gave about the lack of non-Western focused asset libraries, I thought really was so striking to me and made me also think that this may be a problem that is pervasive in a bigger sense that the computational logic of the game engines or of the workflows in the industry, all of them are not representative or maybe not aligned with the indigenous voices and, and ways of, of knowing or, or uh, storytelling. So do you see as a longer term goal or development or need also something about um, a different type of software? Um, or approach to developing software, um, or interfaces, interaction interfaces, and things like that. Yeah, uh, so I, I forgot to say that I'm doing a, I'm currently doing a PhD on art and games uh, decolonization, and um, through my uh, encounters, I also try to see how we can decolonize the ways of representation, because of course, each software comes with 
piece, uh, its own uh, representation, and there are people who are working on uh, maybe some kind of representation that are more linked to Asian culture, for example. So uh, I, I couldn't show everything, and also I tried to show other types of game that I am showing in different uh, conferences. But uh, for example, there is a game, Raji, uh, made in India, who is really trying to show other types of representation. For example, uh, they, of course, um, so it's a hack and slash game, but um, uh, it uses um, uh, mandala, uh, but also um, uh, cir uh, circular way of representing things, and also invest uh, sculpture. Uh, I was also um, talking with people in Korea and Taiwan about um, the fact that, for example, we come with the, the landscape and the portrait representation uh, in the Western culture, which is not um, linked, for example, to um, uh, the fan or, uh, that you can find in, in China. So uh, I also met in Mexico, but his name uh, I cannot re remind it now, uh, but a person uh, who is also a descendant of uh, indigenous uh, population and who developed uh, an operating system that, is, that wanted to be different from, and his father, uh, also created the first computer, but which was an answer or a counter answer uh, to IBM or Apple. So, of course, of course. And uh, I had a discussion with someone again in India who was doing, a, who was working on a game, and but he was trained in uh, in, in the UK. Uh, and, and then when he did his first uh, iteration of the game, he realized that he was totally colonized by, um, by his education. So he decided to totally deconstruct uh, that. And then he redid a project with his mother, who is a, um, a dancer of traditional dance. And he created a, a project in between games and opera. And, so I, I, I would say, yes, it's the next step. We have time for one question. Yes, <laughs> please. Thank you. So thank you for a really uh, amazing talk. And you are like a walking compendium compliment. It was really content that is important. And I look forward to your written thesis as well. But this leads me also to a one, one point. I'm very curious about the piece um, or the pieces you showed about Condomblé and the Orisha, Sim Brasil. When I was doing my PhD on art and politics of play, I was also in Brazil and I was uh, participating at the Condomblé uh, uh, ritual and I was impressed by all the different Orishas, like a whole system of game characters also, representing human needs, etc. And so thank you for your excellent answers already, why it is important to use also digital games to connect these. My question would be here, are you also, do you know these games, are they also connecting to this kind of, again, performative practice of a, a, a condom play or a, or a richer cosmos, also in real life, in physical space? Are they connecting the hybrid so, uh, are they connecting the digital games with the really lived experience of connecting with the Orisha, which you can? <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I don't know if they are like, uh, for example, um, uh, performances, uh, playing with games and uh, Orishas. I'm not aware of, but what I wanted to tell you uh, is that when I arrived in Nigeria, which is where you have uh, most of Yoruba culture, uh, not only uh, in, in West Africa, I could only find a game about uh, the Bible and how to uh, win thanks to the Bible. But it is changing because uh, I was there two years ago and I know that they are now uh, working on um, games more related to, 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 to the culture, but I'm not aware of of something that could 
Then, the, when I was in Lagos, I did a workshop, and many people came, like um, game designers, architects, and, 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 and even dancers. And, and one of them was really interested to make the connection uh, between the game world and dance, and he's also into Yoruba culture. And he was working on a very interesting project that has nothing to do with games, but with decolonization. He was working on a database of dance movement, because dance movements are not protected. And uh, it's also a lot about reappropriation. So, so it might come soon. <laughs> Many thanks, Isabel. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Warm applause. Unfortunately, we are now out of time when it comes to the games and art track, but we'll continue immediately with a new topic. And I will now hand over to my colleague, Houston Rodriguez, who will do the introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much. We reached the final panel on the Expanded Animation 2022. And now on this panel, we have two very interesting talks. Uh, the first one is uh, Philippe Pasquier. Um, Philippe Pasquier is uh, a scientist specializing in uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, he is also a multidisciplinary media artist and educator. And he's a professor at the Simon Fraser University School for Interactive Arts and technology in Vancouver, where he leads the Meta Creation Lab. Thank you very much. Very welcome. Hi. Thank you, uh, Austin, and uh, thank you, thanks, thank you to the organizer for uh, inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be uh, here today uh, in person with you, uh, with you all. So I'm going to talk today about uh, AI, uh, indeed. And as we all know, AI is uh, about everywhere now. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about AI in the sense of strong AI, sentient AI, the AI that possibly will uh, replace us all, because I don't believe in it. And in science, we have no idea how that could be the case so far. We are, it's, a, it's a research topic, but it is not a reality. What is very real, though, is that we have a lot of algorithms that are indeed automat automatizing tasks that before and previously and not that long ago were only possible to be uh, achieved using a human brain. And that goes from finding the shortest path on a Google map, then driving a car, flying a plane, regulating an, uh, a nuclear plant. But what we do at the Meta Creation Lab is look